Hello and welcome to Spotlight on Evidence-Informed Approaches to Tutoring Literacy with SP Tutors. We're delighted that you've joined us. My name is Lizzie Swan and I'm part of the SP Tutors core team, creating a bespoke and responsive training programme for tutors, achieving the SP Tutors vision of accelerating progress for children's learning, especially those most disadvantaged during the COVID-19 pandemic through high quality evidence-informed tutoring. SP Tutors have collaborated with Anspear Publishing to create a mobile learning app, Tutor Know How. Tutor Know How places tutors in control of the time, place and pace of training. These live spotlight sessions perform a key element of our specialist training. Devised and delivered by a range of expert practitioners from the SP Tutors Network, these sessions enhance tutors' evidence-informed practice, highlighting the best and most up-to-date research. You'll find links to the spotlight sessions and an ever-increasing wealth of specialist, bespoke resources via your Tutor Know How app by clicking on the specialist sessions. In this session, I'm proud to introduce Ruth Everett, a fellow of the Chartered College of Teaching, lead in English, Literacy and Management for Unity Schools Partnership and Lead English Tutor for Suffolk and Norfolk Skit. Ruth supports secondary and primary schools in school improvement through raising standards of English and literacy provision across the curriculum. Ruth's teaching career spans over 33 years in key stages two through to key stage five. During this time, she has worked in Essex as a deputy head teacher in two secondary schools and an acting head teacher in one. Working with research school network colleagues has convinced Ruth that the most effective way we can raise achievement of our students is through high quality, iterative, continued professional development and professional mentoring, which supports the production of rigorous curricula based upon the most recent robust evidence such as the Education Endowment Foundation guidance reports. Ruth is going to introduce you to uh, SP Tutors guiding principles to support evidence-informed practice for the tutoring of literacy. This is the first in a series of six sessions on literacy designed to meet the needs of all tutors, regardless of their subject specialism. The following five sessions will offer a deep dive into the five guiding principles. During the presentation, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to ask questions related to the topic of literacy approaches, and we'll endeavour to answer as many as we can at the end of the session. I'm delighted to hand you over to Ruth now to begin our presentation. Thank you, Lizzie. Okay, um, welcome to this session, as Lizzie says. Um, I'm going to pitch straight in there and we're going to look at why literacy is so fundamentally important to students, to everybody, not just children in school, everybody. So I'll just give you a moment to read these quotes on the screen. One is by Ludwig Wittgenstein, philosopher. I think I just want to summarise what all three of those quotations are saying in just one phrase, which is, um, in a nutshell, literacy empowers. Now, let's just think about that for a moment. I'm going to give you some rather shocking statistics. So 13% of the adult population is what we would call functionally illiterate. That's 7.1 million adults. The DfE said in 2018, one in five children left primary school unable to read and write properly. I cannot emphasise sufficiently just how disadvantaged those children will be if they leave school unable to read and write, because literacy and the ability to read and write underpins every aspect of the school curriculum. Thank you, Joe. Just looking at this um, quite shocking graphic now, 
So if you can see, the gap in literacy begins when children start school at the age of five. And shockingly, the gap widens as children get older and go through the key stages. Quite the reverse of what one as a teacher would hope. As a teacher of many years, um, and I worked as hard as I possibly could, I, I find that really depressing, the thought that children start school and the disadvantaged children are more disadvantaged at the end of their school career. Next slide, please, Joe. Now, if you have a look at the, the writing next to that uh, graphic, the third paragraph is what I want to draw your attention to because this is what you will be doing. You will be intervening. Now, unfortunately, it's taken COVID perhaps to really sharpen our focus and, and get the budget and the resources behind intervention. If we could in, intervene earlier, i.e. reception or preschool even, the children wouldn't come to school so disadvantaged. But you as tutors can play a major role now in trying to catch up the education opportunities that many of our students will have lost because of the pandemic. Interestingly, if you look at the last paragraph, the attainment gap between advantaged and disadvantaged students isn't dependent on whether the school is an Ofsted outstanding or not. The gap is as large in schools rated outstanding as in schools rated inadequate. Thank you, Jo. Now, some of you might have heard of this. Um, so the, the Matthew effect is the name for, well, it comes from St. Matthew's Gospel. But it's for, it, it describes what happens to children who come to school already disadvantaged. What it's suggesting is, like St Matthew's Gospel, the rich get richer. So in other words, children who arrive at school at the age of five already being able to read, perhaps already having had many, many hours of books read to them, they will build on those skills and they will benefit and they will out maneuver every other child that they meet because they will have had that boost at the early stages of their life. Children who haven't had that, who haven't had those advantageous early educational experiences are going to be on the back foot. The children that you're going to be dealing with have now had the extra disadvantage of COVID and therefore, we desperately need them to have this intervention. So we try to close the gap on the disadvantage and reverse the effect of the Matthew effect. Thank you, Joe. So the EEF is suggesting that the amazing work that colleagues all over the country for the last decade have been doing will, will now have to regress that children as a result of lockdown, lockdown three now, many unfortunately, so sadly, will have regressed in their speaking, their reading and their writing. And that's why the role that you're going to take is absolutely instrumental. You're going to intervene and hopefully begin to close this gap. Thank you, Joe. So a deficit in literacy skills has an even greater impact for students who are experiencing remote learning. We all know that logging onto a computer, it isn't, it isn't necessarily easy for lots of children. Some children won't have the number of computers at home that others will have. So what you're going to be doing as high quality tutors, you might make up as much as three to five months of lost learning, maybe more, let's hope so. So what I would like to try to do in the next five sessions after this one is to give you some research-based strategies, evidence-based strategies to support how you work with your children 
so that they are beginning to think and engage in their own learning. It isn't a question of telling them how to learn, it's a question of showing them how to learn, how to model how they can help themselves, teach them through modelling the strategies that they can improve their own learning with. Thank you, Jo. So I think we ought to just have a quick look at what the National Curriculum Literacy Aims are. I'm not going to read them all through, I'll just let you have a look at these, but what I'd like you to understand from these um, aims is why I've built the five principles that we're going to go on and look at on these aims. So if you look, the first two are very much about reading reading with fluency with good understanding reading widely these are massive um, issues to do with reading it isn't just about reading widely as we know it's about motivating children to read it's about getting them to look at fiction and non-fiction and supporting them with the difficulties and barriers that they might have towards reading so that is going to be our principle one the second principle will be vaguely um, based on bullet point three, acquiring a wide vocabulary and also looking at how spelling and words and vocabulary are all linked and will support children being more able um, students. We will also be looking at writing clearly. We're going to be looking at the principles of writing and how writing isn't an outcome it's a process. And in key stage one and two, writing is very much taught as a process with drafting, modeling, redrafting, editing. At secondary school, we tend to just think about it as the final product, as the outcome. And we can't afford to do that. Children need to be independent in how they write and understand that it's a process, not an outcome. The last two bullet points, again, will link to one of our principles, and that is the importance of being articulate, the importance of speaking and listening. So although they, the principles that we are going to be looking at aren't necessarily in the order that appear with the national curriculum, we'll be covering those. And I hope to introduce you to many practical evidence-based strategies that teachers all over England at the moment are using with real impact. Thank you, Joe. So before we start looking at each principle in microcosm today, we're not going to be looking at them in detail. I'm just doing an overview of the next five sessions. To tutor effectively, you need to understand how, the how children learn to read and write, and the evidence behind that will support you when you're then teaching children um, and tutoring them. We can then prepare the necessary resources from an evidence base, which will improve their whole school literacy. And likewise, what we call disciplinary literacy. That means the literacy that they meet in every subject. So for example, in science, um, a child might need to access very, very complex polysyllabic Latinate vocabulary. For example, the word photosynthesis. In history, they might need to come across, or in, in RE, they might have to come across a very challenging term, transubstantiation, for example. That's what we mean by disciplinary literacy, where literacy is unique to the subject. So we'll be touching upon that all the way through. So, for example, historians need to write like historians. To get a, a, a high grade at GCSE and A-level, a historian needs to write very much with the active voice. Hitler invaded Europe. That's active voice. Whereas in science, the passive use voice is used much, much more. So that's what we mean by disciplinary literacy. It's understanding the generic approaches that we'll be looking at today and, and in other days, but then honing them down to the individual subjects as needed and as required by secondary teachers. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm just gonna leave you to look at this quote because it's 
a very interesting one, I think. The transition between key stage two and key stage three is a massive one. There are lots and lots of reasons for this, but the one effect of key stage two to three that we know is, it, it is absolutely to the, to the point really, is that there isn't one approach that will close the difficulties from key stage two to three that will deal with them. So what we need to do and you need to do more um, relevantly, as tutors is to try different approaches. But those approaches need to be ones that have been tried and tested elsewhere and have worked and are effective. So just to give you a little bit of background to, to the key stage two, three transition, in America, we call that the fourth grade slump. And it's when children regress most in the education system. At any transition, there is regression lots and lots of reasons and research around this. But we know that between key stage two and three, the biggest regression happens. A couple of reasons for that are things like when they're in year six and all the way through primary school, children have one teacher in one classroom with one TA who might know their parents and, and greet them in the playground every morning. Suddenly they come to year seven and that, that we, we lose that contact with home and the children are code switching. They're going from geography to PE to maths to English, and that uses up a lot of their working memory and they become overwhelmed. So I just think we need to bear this in mind that all approaches need to fit and best fit the students that you've got and that not one um, approach will necessarily fit all of the of the tutees that you will be meeting. Okay, next slide, please, Joe. Okay, let's just look at the first of our principles then. Now, for me, reading is the core skill in the curriculum. It serves everything else. However good a biology teacher or a music teacher you are, if a child can't read independently and automatically, when they get into an exam situation, they are not going to be successful. So for me, reading is what I would call the core skill. Now, in the first of our next webinars, the first webinar after this one, we'll be looking at what makes a good reader. It's hard reading. And the problem is that many of us as teachers and tutors will be good readers. So we don't realize it's hard because we've got past that. And that's called the curse of knowledge. We assume too much. We don't understand what it's like not to be able to read. So in our first session, we'll be looking at the differences between decoding, which is looking at a phoneme. So for example, in the word cat, there are three, kata, and sounding them out. That's what we mean by decoding. And then we'll be looking at what we mean by comprehension, which is the understanding without needing to decode. We'll be looking at ways that you can encourage reading fluency. Now, fluency doesn't mean quite the same as fluently. Um, it means things like reading to pace. It means reading with intonation, reading with self-correction, and also how you might be able to motivate your students that you're meeting, your duties. We'll be looking at the, the very valuable and underrated use of re-reading. We all know that when you've read something once, the second time you come across the same text, you'll find it easier. This is a strategy that we don't tend to use enough. We're always looking at the clock and thinking, have we got time? We haven't got time to reread that. I would argue as tutors, you need to be prepared to reread and get the children to reread what you've read to them. This will help them to automate words, become fluent in their reading, 
that makes them more motivated and that will make them want to learn because they'll have success. So I'll be asking you to model reading fluency, but to be able to model reading fluency, you first need to know what goes into it and how we learn to read and be able to forensically um, explicitly teach that. The other um, strategy that we can look at is using texts which you reread, but on a wide basis, which contain readable words. So for to, to kind of give them more of a hinterland, to give children who have, haven't read a huge amount, to get them that love of reading by maybe giving them reading, um, which is slightly less challenging, but getting their stamina up and to be reading at pace. So there's a mixture between the challenge of some reading texts, but also texts that they can read with aplomb and read fluently and with automaticity. Thank you, Joe. Now, the Scarborough Reading Rope is my all time favourite graphic as an English teacher. If I had my way, this would be pinned up on every classroom or and next to every teacher's um, desktop in the classroom. This is what we'll be looking at in detail on our first session on reading. If you have a look at it, you'll see the two colours and the bottom colour, the orange, basically can be, this is simplistically now I'm putting this, but can be leveled at key stage one and two. And my primary colleagues will probably all go into uproar about that. I'm not suggesting for a moment that that's all they do. What I'm suggesting is that we as secondary colleagues at least, assume that children when they get to year seven can read by sight, can decode, and are aware of phonics, which are the bottom three strands. In other words, they can recognize words. We feel, as secondary colleagues, I think, we assume wrongly that children are just comprehending. Now to comprehend, you can see there are five very, very tricky strands to master. One of them being vocabulary, Another being verbal reasoning, and that's where children need metaphor and inference and prediction to be able to understand hidden meanings in a text, meaning which isn't literal. Background knowledge is massive with reading. If you don't have prior knowledge of a subject and you're asked to read about it, and the person sitting next to you has got that prior knowledge, they are going to be making far more, um, having far more success in the lesson than you will because you won't have any knowledge to stick it onto. The new knowledge won't be able to stick onto existing knowledge. So the Scarborough Reading Rope is, a, is a, an essential graphic, the complexities of reading. Many strands are woven into skilled reading. You only need to take out one of those strands from either of the green or the orange colors. And it's a bit like a Jenga model. Take one of them out and the whole model becomes a little bit wobbly. Children have got to be confident in all those strands to be fluent, automatic readers. Thank you, Joe. So that will, that will have been our first um, webinar. Principle one was reading. Our second is vocabulary and spelling. Now I've put spelling in here purely because I always think that teachers miss a bit of a trick with spelling. If you're looking closely at vocabulary and breaking words up into their morphemes and their syllables, why not alert children to spelling at the same time? So we will be looking at spelling, but not as much as vocabulary. Um, thanks to Alex Quigley with his closing the word gap and, and other amazing um, teachers who have now written fabulous books based upon research-based evidence. Lots of schools have now really feel much more confident about teaching vocabulary. My slight concern is that some teachers think of it as a little bit of a tick box that they can kind of just say we've done that. Actually effective vocabulary teaching is done as reading and writing is taught. It's not separate. It's part and parcel, it's integral. It might interest you, those of you who I hope by the end of this session 
I've um, made enthusiastic enough about literacy to think, gosh, this is fascinating. And, and hopefully you're realising that you can't teach anything if a child can't read. And therefore, literacy for me underpins absolutely every aspect of um, education for children. You might like to download a copy of the Why Closing the Word Gap Matters. It's really interesting. It's very readable and it's in case studies. But it came as a result of um, Oxford Unity, Unity Press. Um, asking existing teachers what proportion of children are affected by the word gap? What are the root causes? How does a paucity in vocabulary, a lack of vocabulary, impact children's wider life chances? And most importantly, what can we do about it? And they print some of the fabulous work that's going on in schools all around the country to do exactly that, to what we call close the vocabulary gap. But just that, I just want to stress again, I, I am concerned that some teachers think by teaching vocabulary explicitly, they are kind of, that's it, they've done their job. For me, it's not like that. Teaching vocabulary as part of reading is the answer. So all the time referring to vocabulary. Thank you, Joe. So in essence, what we need to do when we teach reading and vocabulary is we need to teach it explicitly. In other words, don't assume, we, you shouldn't assume that children will know a word. You shouldn't assume they can read a word. You're checking all the time on their knowledge and their prior knowledge. So we need to teach it explicitly, consistently. If every teacher in the school is using the same type of vocabulary and reading instruction, that lowers the um, strain on students' working memory, and that will allow them, therefore, to pick up the actual knowledge you're wanting them to teach without overburdening the working memory. So those three very key factors, you need to be explicit about your teaching, you need to be consistent in the approaches you use, and you need to be methodical. My view on the National Tutoring Programme and what children need from us is incisive support. We need to know what we want to complete with those children in what session. We need clarity and we need to focus on what we're going to be doing in short steps to be successful. Finally, on that slide, as this runs all the way through this presentation. All of these strategies will, will benefit students, but they'll have even more benefit on those children coming from what I would call word poor homes. Now that doesn't actually mean there aren't any books in the house. It can also mean that their parents aren't finding perhaps the time, and I'm not being judgmental about that. A lot of parents are very, very stressed and working very hard. If you're a shift worker, it is very difficult to find time to read to your children, for example. But children don't just need to read at home. It's about what language they're hearing, what language is being shared around the living room in the evening. So that's what I mean by word poor homes. Thank you, Joe. Um, these are some quite interesting uh, little quotes. So the um, educator researcher um, Hirsch suggests that vocabulary size is a very, very good predictor. It's a proxy for a whole range of educational attainments. Um, if you look at the quote underneath from Spencer Clegg and Stackhouse, Vocabulary is one of the factors, only one, remember the Scarborough rope, it's only one element of that Scarborough reading rope that has proved relevant to children achieving an A star to C in old money. So again, remember what I said earlier, different interventions work for different children at different times and it's choosing the best one at that time. But vocabulary is a very strong indicator of future academic success. Why? Because of that reading gap that starts when children arrive at the age of five. That children from more middle class homes who will tend to be read to, and the statistics shockingly say far more mothers read to their children than fathers. That's an interesting one, but for another, another day, another webinar. Um, 
those children who have been read to from an early age will, will have an advantage. Remember, it's not just about reading, it's about listening and hearing vocabulary as well. Thank you, Jo. Now, I always find this top um, quotation quite shocking and it's widely used. So I'll just let you look at that one from Hart and Risley. So parents in professional families in studies spoke 32 million more words to their children than parents in welfare families. Shockingly um, graphic, really, statistic, that one. The talk gap. Children with a restricted vocabulary at five, so when they start school, are found to be poor readers as adults. So that's what I mean going back to what Hirsch said before about vocabulary being an accurate, as accurate as any kind of predictor about how a child is going to succeed um, when, they, when they've got poor literacy, when they begin schools and if they've come from a word poor home. And again, I hope what this, these two um, quotations stress to you as tutors is it's not just about what you're exposing the children to do in written print, it's about how you use your dialogue and the words that you use when you're tutoring. It's really important to challenge the students that you're working with, with challenging vocabulary that you scaffold for them, you explain, but you don't dumb down language. Next slide please, Joe. So that moves nicely on to principle three. And as I say, I, I personally have put principle one first, principle one reading first rather, um, because I feel so strongly that reading underpins absolutely everything. But you could argue quite easily that principle three ought to be principle one. That without quality talk in the classroom, without being able to be articulate and speak clearly, you're at a disadvantage. And this very, Apposite quote, um, reading and writing float on a sea of talk. I think that's a lovely way of putting that, that however important reading and writing are, children won't achieve, children won't have success unless they can listen and respond and they are stimulated and modelled articulacy from their caregivers, and their teachers. Um, without wanting to be too anecdotal, there, are, there there's a child in our local area I know who hasn't been able to go to nursery or play group because both her parents um, are very vulnerable um, with COVID. And I've noticed that little girl's speech and language development when I bumped into her on walks is, has gone backwards. And, and this is what you're going to be facing. There'll be children who haven't had the necessary amount of talk in their lives over the pandemic. Many children and many of us, let's be honest, are surviving by doing what we find the easiest at the moment. So there'll be lots of children who will be plugged into a video, plugged into an Xbox. So they won't be hearing live talk. They won't be having that important dialogic talk that parents can give their children and their siblings too. Think of it, they're not meeting everybody in the playground and make and explaining what they were doing or what they made of Love Island the night before. All that really important conversation, doesn't have to be academic conversation, just conversation isn't happening in the way it should be at the moment. Thank you, Jo. So, Following on from our focus on closing the word gap, the vocabulary, we will look at how you might be able to develop articulacy. And you're in a, a wonderful position to do that as a tutor with the small group of children or even better one-to-one. -one. Because by, by encouraging children to talk eloquently, you're then helping to support their more formal writing because they need that more formal vocabulary. So, I'm not sure um, whether you know about the terms tiers two, one, two and three words, but very often the most academic words in our curriculum, let's take the example for something like um, osmosis in science or Pythagoras in maths, 
we call those tier three words. They are um, subject specific very often. Um, let, you know, isosceles certainly in a, is a maths tier three word and they will often have a Latin or Greek origin. Um, what we can do and you can do as tutors is not shy away from using challenging words. And more importantly, you want your children, your students to imitate your words. You want them to start using more challenging words themselves. So for example, if you're tutoring with maths, you need to talk about multiplying rather than timesing, rather than using whole number, the word integer. Okay, so that you're all the time suggesting synonyms, so you're expanding the vocabulary gap and high challenge, as long as you explain what you mean if they don't understand, but then you go back to using the subject specific term. Tier two words are words which come up, which can be quite challenging, but aren't necessarily subject specific. So a word like religious or sacred. Um, a lot of the command words on language papers, um, sorry, exam papers, like consolidate, evaluate, describe, inform. That's what we call tier two words. And tier one words, we'll be looking at this in detail on um, session two with vocabulary. Um, tier one words are everyday words that don't need much explanation. So words like table, cup, floor, dog words that children don't tend to need any explanation of. Thank you, Joe. So principle four, obviously very, very connected with principle one. Um, and I, as I say, I had to kind of find five principles. So I'm not gonna get bogged down on the, on the chronology of those principles, but reading comprehension. Now, the goal of any reading, let's be honest, why do we read? It's not just for pleasure, it's to understand a text, okay? So the most important thing a teacher can do is teach a child to understand. Now, as the child goes through the school, texts, any information becomes harder. We also have faced, um, it's one of the reasons why there's that regression at key stage two to three, um, we move largely from fiction lower down the key stages to the main diet of students at secondary school is non-fiction. Non-fiction texts, so taking, for example, something like um, how to make a, how to assemble something from Ikea, they're always tricky, aren't they? Um, a non-fiction text, you need to understand 95% of the words to understand the whole passage. So non-fiction creates lots of challenges for secondary school children particularly. Non-fiction tends to become much more prevalent from about year four at the beginnings of key stage two upwards. So you as tutors need to explicitly teach strategies for children to check their understanding. Now I know that sounds a bit odd, so let me just explain that. Successful readers like us, is going back to this idea of power of knowledge. We're so successful in our reading that we're not, we don't have a problem with understanding. When we don't understand something, when you're a good reader, what do we do? We stop, don't we? And we, we employ a number of strategies. So if I'm reading something I'm not familiar with or I don't understand, or if I'm tired and, I haven't, and it hasn't gone in first time, what do I do? I go back and I ask myself questions. I'll say something like, oh, I didn't get that. Why didn't I get that? I'm tired. Maybe I'll do this later. Or I need to look that word up. I don't know what that word means. So I don't understand what I'm reading. Struggling readers, however, are unable to recognise when they've understood part of a text because then they might be decoding. So they're still at that stage of using morphemes or syllables. So they're not actually reading to comprehend, they're deciphering still. So what our reading comprehension webinar will look at is very simple, straightforward, research-based strategies to support children with learning how to comprehend and to check their own comprehension. So when you're not there in an exam, 
they can check whether they're understanding. Now, the ways to do that are through, a, there's a number of approaches, but we'll be looking at how summarization, which is actually very difficult, supports comprehension, how prediction and clarification, questioning massively important in when you're reading something, do I understand this? Why has Dickens used the word malevolent there? Why has the writer used italics? Why has the exam paper put this in bold? asking yourself questions to aid your understanding and lastly but not in any order activating prior knowledge i've mentioned that before how crucial it is that background knowledge if you have background knowledge that you can that you stick i think uh, hirsch calls it velcro knowledge this idea that if you've already got some knowledge let's say you're studying the nazis if you've got some knowledge already that Hitler was the leader of the Third Reich and it was in Germany during 1939, you know, the, the Second World War. When the teacher starts talking about something like the Holocaust, which is a very difficult term and a very subject specific one, that's a tier three word, you're going to be able to stick it onto some knowledge you've already got. So as tutors, you need to be able to check that the students have got the prior knowledge of, a, of something before you teach it to them. And if they haven't, you've got to provide them with some so they can stick what you're putting new to existing knowledge. Thank you, Joe. And the last of the principles we'll be covering is the writing process. Now, just let you look at this very useful quote, I think. Writing is thinking. To write well is to think clearly. That's why it's so hard. Now, rather like the Scarborough reading rope, which I think brilliantly exemplifies just how challenging reading is, writing is tough. When you write, you're doing so many things at once. Next slide, Joe, please. So let's just look at why writing is just so challenging. Look at all the different strands. Right, think back to the Scarborough rope for the reading. I think I'm going to make a million one day and think of a writing rope, and maybe you can, you can beat me to it. But we need a writing rope, really, don't we? Have a look at just the factors, the concepts, I don't know what you want to call them, the skills that, that go into a good piece of writing. And unfortunately, as I said to you before, in secondary schools, we tend to just want them to finish the outcome. So we'll think, oh, we don't need to bother with all of that. I just want them to write this because they've understood it. In actual fact, children need to be taught those different um, skills which make writing successful. And I, I'm sure you've heard of what we mean by chunking. So teaching writing in small steps. So when you're, when you're helping a child with a year 11 essay for geography or for history, you teach them how to write an effective introduction. You model it, you look at good introductions, you break it down, you deconstruct it and you see, and then you build it up again. You don't get them to write the whole essay. You'll then support them with a scaffold um, for the middle part of the essay, where they're making one point at a time and providing evidence and explanation for their thinking and examples. And then you'll teach them the conclusion. So we'll be looking at ways of supporting children in writing. So that the key to take away from just this is writing is a process, it's not an outcome. And you'll be pleased to know, I'm sure you're very tired of listening to me now, we're nearly at the end. Um, so the implications on poor literacy for teaching writing. Children have to master the basics. They have to know, for example, how to punctuate if they're, if they're going to make themselves understood in the written word. If we give them a task like writing a full essay or writing up an experiment in science too soon without explaining the steps and, and analyzing the genre and seeing what needs to go into an effective science write-up, we're gonna overload the children's working memory. 
So what can we do about that? We need to break down the writing instruction into small chunks and then practice those chunks in isolation. So, you know, how to include quotations into a sentence, how to write a subordinate clause and the use of it in a, in a complex sentence. And to do this, we need to provide them with scaffolds, scaffolds meaning support, modelled examples. We need to model our own writing. And the most successful way of modelling writing is to do it wrong and say to the children, oh, that's not very good, is it? I don't think that's a very good sentence at all. Help me with that, somebody. Can you help me rewrite that? I haven't made my point clearly. So you're um, modelling your own metacognitive difficulties at that point because children will love that. Children learn far more by somebody who's a learner themselves and can say, can you see what I've done wrong there? Point out the misconceptions. Never be afraid of saying you don't know something because children love that because it makes them feel they're not the only person that's that's struggling with something difficult. Uh, next slide, please. So I think that, that's the end of what I'm going to say today. So hopefully what I've done is give you a whistle top stop tour of why I think that you're magnificent people taking on this challenge, because I think you are. Um, you know, I've spent Oh, it's about 35 years now working with with uh, staff and children who are disadvantaged. I don't really like the term, but um, we know that when you get a fabulous teacher, that makes all the difference to children. And you've got this rare opportunity. Um, and I think it's a privileged opportunity to make a huge difference to these kids all over the country who are who are missing out on having wonderful teaching at the moment. Um, so I've hopefully put that into some kind of perspective for you, that intervention, the earlier it goes, the better, but intervention at all is useful. And that's what you're going to be doing now. So your intervention needs to be precise. It needs to be focused, needs to be small steps, manageable steps, which will lead children su to success. Because with success comes motivation to do more of it. So the five webinars, just to finish, will be based around the principles there in that order. And I believe I'm going to hand over to Lizzie now and she'll, she'll probably tell you a little bit more about the date for the first one. So the reading webinar will be first. Um, very odd to be uh, talking to people who I can't see. Very, very strange. But um, it was nice to, to have that time with you. And I, I hope, you know, that you'll enjoy some of these sessions. And most importantly, that they will provide you with some real evidence-based practical strategies that are being used all over the country with success and having impact to students who want to learn but ne aren't necessarily in the best place at the moment to learn. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. So during the presentation, you've had the opportunity to input some questions in the Q&A function. If you've not yet had opportunity, please do that now and we'll endeavour to answer as many of your questions as possible. If we don't have um, opportunity to answer all of those questions now, we'll either answer them by email or we'll answer them using the frequently answered questions on the SP Tutors website. One of the questions that has come through is asking when is the first of those deep dive sessions looking at reading and I'm delighted to let you know that the spotlight on evidence informed approaches to reading is on Thursday the 11th of February and that will be taking place live at 2pm. If you'd like to register for attending that session live, please do register on Eventbrite. And don't forget, if you're not able to attend live, you can also register to receive a recording of that so that you can access that later. SP Tutors endeavours to enable all of our tutors to access our training at your time, place and own pace. So I'm just gonna have a look now through some of the Q&A. And please do take this opportunity to ask Ruth as our specialist. This is, your, um, this is your chance to ask some of those questions going through. 
So um, the next five webinars, I'm not able to give you all of those dates. I've just given you um, the first one and I'm, um, you'll probably hear the paper turning. I'm quite old school in the fact that I do use uh, pen and paper. So I'm just gonna go through. I'm able to give you um, the first two. The next one is on, apologies, just one second. This next one after that is on Tuesday, the 2nd of March. And that will be a deep dive into vocabulary. And I cannot stress how much I would like all tutors of all subject areas um, to attend that session again, because as Ruth has already touched upon, you know, looking at how we approach uh, the, the topics of uh, disciplinary vocabulary. I don't know if Ruth, you want to add anything there. Oh well, yes, I mean, the work I do is um, as a school improvement partner with schools, um, the most useful sessions that people have said um, from science and maths backgrounds are the vocabulary sessions for science and math mathematicians. Um, as I said to you before, um, for me, science is the hardest subject in terms of literacy. And it was only since I stepped out of, back from the classroom that I've, I've done a lot of work on this and realised just how tough it is to teach science to children who are not strong with their literacy um, and that is purely because as i said to you before 95 percent of words in a non-fiction text have to be understood now if you don't believe me i'm going to show you that <laughs> when we do webinars one and two i'll give you some examples um, if, if, if literally just very quickly think about a sentence with a noun in it so let's say something like uh, respiration allows you to breathe Respiration is a noun. You can't substitute it. Well, you can, you, there are synonyms for it. But what I'm trying to suggest is if you don't know what respiration means, you are stuck. Whereas in the sentence in an English, let's say Charles Dickens novel, um, Fagin was malicious and evil in how he treated Oliver. You could take malicious and evil out of that sentence and substitute it with a Trumpism like bad, um, you know, a one syllabled word, um, and you'd get away with it, wouldn't you? Malevolent synonym bad. Or you can take it straight out of the sentence. You don't have to have it. So, why it's so difficult for teachers of non fiction in maths and science is you've got to teach them those polysyllabic Latinate and Greek origin words it's called etymology, the etymology of those. You can't guess what osmosis, Pythagoras, etc. are. Whereas in more like modern foreign languages and English, you can substitute with other synonyms. Um, and the other thing I would say about that, you know, I run a lot of sessions for, the, for schools around the country and a lot of um, teachers say that they are surprised when they've really understood literacy why they're not getting the results it's nothing to do with their teaching of their subject it's everything to do with their, the children's literacy not being at a level where they can stick the new knowledge on because they haven't got that that confidence in the literacy in speaking listening talking and reading thank you Ruth. thank you very much um, so the, uh, another question that's come in is around whether or not in some of the webinars we'll be looking at the aspect of tutoring um, children who have English as an additional language. Yeah, so um, children, <laughs> interesting that question. Um, so a, a school just down the road to me um, has a high proportion of the EAL students. Interestingly, many EAL students have come from their, their heritage tongue, if you like, um, often they've been taught grammar much, much more effectively than, than children in the British system. So it isn't, there are ways to support children. Obviously, they've got difficulties as EAL students with the English curriculum. I'm not, I'm not saying they haven't. But there are ways that you can use their strengths and what they have already in terms of an understanding of grammar. You know, they, they, they tend to be much more averse with words like complex sentences, compound sentences because they might have been taught that before. So we will look at that. I can't say we'll have a huge amount of time, but it's certainly something I'll make a note of and perhaps we can have some discussion about. And, and I'll think about some specific strategies that would support EAL students. Hello, 
that now. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, I'm just going to go through a couple, just double check on the Q&A. Um, excellent question coming through. It's the last question we're going to take. Any others that come through, we will answer by email. Um, will dyslexia issues and strategies be covered? I can answer that from an SEND um, perspective. Um, I'm a SEMCO and have been for about for about, I was going to, I couldn't remember for a moment, but about 12 years, about 12, 15 years. And um, we will be putting on some specialist sessions to cover um, special educational needs and disabilities. Um, however, Ruth, will you be covering anything spe specifically within yeah, literacy um, around supporting children with dyslexia? Yeah, so so um, I was talking to Lizzie beforehand, actually. I, I, I work on a consultant teacher for the Driver Youth Trust, which is also a literacy um, charity. And so, yes. I don't like to, when I'm talking to teachers as a whole body, I include the same strategies that I would use in terms of reading, writing, listening, speaking with SEN children to other children, all children, because good, effective, explicit, consistent literacy teaching should be taught the same way to all children. They'll all benefit from it. So whilst children with dyslexia have additional difficulties i'm not i'm not you know i'm not denying that the set the, the strategies we'll be covering will support those children as much if not more than others thank you that's pretty much what i would say thank you very much um a couple of last comments before we close and um, we have a spotlight session this thursday which is looking at the PERMA theory, which is the five tenets of well-being. And um, for anyone who wants to do a little bit of research in advance of that session, please do look at positive psychology and the work of Martin Seligman. So I'm really delighted to be sharing some of the research um, around the PERMA theory and building positive relationships and connections with the pupils that we are tutoring. So lastly, all that's left for me to say is um, to continue the conversation with SP tutors, please do keep in touch with us. You can use social media, Twitter and Instagram. And um, we will be looking to try and get some more feedback from you following on from this spotlight session. Thank you so much for sharing praise for Ruth's session. I certainly took a huge amount from it myself. And thank you for sharing your comments. But we'll also be sharing a survey with you following on from this session to ask you some how you felt about the session, but also if there's any training in other areas that you feel that you as a tutor would benefit from. We look forward to seeing you at our next Spotlight session. Thank you so much.